Uh, let me start off, I, I introduce myself. I'm Kevin Creole from uh, Tirius Research, a uh, market advisory uh, company and a former editor-in-chief of Microprocessor Report and uh, been involved in a few startups and a few companies along the way, NVIDIA, AMD. So um, I'm here, I'm really proud and happy to be here to support Applied Micro. Um, and this is the beginning of the ARM 64-bit era. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to get in on the ground floor of this product. And um, it's, it's the first, you know, customizable 64-bit instructions, or customizable parts using a 64-bit instruction set that are power efficient and uh, offers a lot of hope for the future for more power efficient processing. Uh, and, and Applied Micro is the first to market with this product. And this is a real silicon working, and we've got some uh, vendors that will talk about it and their experience with working with Applied Micro on this product. And today we brought together a number of, of thought leaders and pioneers that are going to bring this energy efficiency and uh, TCO benefits to the, uh, the HPC market. Let me uh, introduce our panelists here. We have, uh, let's see, Piero Alto, from project manager at uh, E4. Uh, he's the uh, ARM HPC uh, lead and has joined them in uh, 2011 after years of research, uh, years at a research university. Join the panel. We'll uh, uh, then have Paul Arts, HPC director from Eurotech. Uh, Paul's the head of engineering for all HPC related R and D at Eurotech. He's got an MS double E from uh, Einhorn, uh, Einhorn University. Yes, sorry. Also, uh, David uh, David uh, Low Powers. <laughs> low the low silent though. <laughs> He's head of HPC at Boston, although I, Boston Limited. Please join the panel. He's got, uh, let's see, uh, out, of, out of sequence here. Oh, here we go. Uh, uh, he's all involved in deploying, tuning, and developing clusters. He's a real veteran of the ARM Wars, uh, having served in the early uh, Cal Zeta campaign. And uh, he, st he still has a sense, and still has a sense of humor. Um, and then uh, uh, Gilead uh, Shamer from uh, Mellanox. Uh, he's vice president of marketing at Mellanox, but he's a man of mystery. That's all he'll tell me. And fr finally, uh, Sumit Gutta from uh, NVIDIA, um, who's uh, heading up the, uh, uh, the Tesla product line. He's the general manager of the Tesla product at, at NVIDIA. And uh, so we've got everybody up here. And I've got, we've got a series of, com of questions. We don't have a whole lot of time because we're running a little bit late. But we got some uh, important questions here. Actually, um, maybe each one of you give us a really quick introduction to your company. Uh, not everybody's familiar with what you guys do. And then uh, let's we'll start with Sumit. Okay, sure. So, um, oh, hang on a second. Let's see. Microphones. Mic oh, there you go. So um, uh, I hope everyone here knows NVIDIA. Uh, we, we make GPU accelerators uh, primarily for the HPC market. Um, and um, you know, we, we started in HPC, but fundamentally what we make is an accelerator for any kind of application that needs performance, right? So if you have a compute intensive application, we can, uh, we can uh, hopefully give it more performance through our accelerators. We've uh, started in HPC, we've been quite successful. Uh, 10 of the top 10 uh, green 500 machines now uh, use our GPUs. Uh, so to tell you the energy efficiency story there, uh, obviously there's lots of very large systems with GPUs. Um, so Mellanox is a company that delivers end-to-end -end interconnect solutions, uh, running at speeds of 40, 56 gigabit per second, supporting protocols, startup protocols of both Ethernet and InfiniBand. Uh, on Monday, we announced the first, uh, this first solutions for 100 gigabit per second on the switch side. So. Uh, pushing the speeds very fast, enabling moving data much faster within infrastructure, enabling the use of data. Um, we also, I think for the first time, demonstrated a working solution, production ready with Applied Micro on ARM 64 bits, achieving 1.5 microsecond latency with 40 gigabit per second bandwidth. So that's showing that the combinations of both the 64-bit ARM from, from Applied Micro and Melanox InfiniBand can really deliver solutions that can fit the HPC workloads. 
And uh, Boston Limited have been doing HPC for well over a decade and a half at this stage. But I think the most um, important part is that we've got a, a long sort of history with ARM and uh, ARM solutions. So as you alluded to, we've been working with Calzita for over three years on the ARM 32-bit cycles. So we've got a lot of experience both in the hardware and in the software side of things. And we're now working with APM on our 64-bit reshuffle, which is what people have been crying out for for the last while. So yeah, we've been working with ARM for quite some time and see it as a real key product in our HPC portfolio moving forward. Pierre? Before is a company which is active about 10 years in uh, HPC community. We are doing appliances for HPC and storage, and uh, we are active with the ARM since um, three years. We have already developed a solution based on ARM 32-bit plus GPUs, uh, and now we moved uh, to ARM 64-bit. And uh, recently we have developed a solution with uh, ARM 64-bit Xgene plus InfiniBand and GPUs. So basically the, the full stack to make a, an HPC cluster. Eurotech is in uh, HPC also uh, 15 years. We enabled uh, technology in the, uh, in the HPC market, uh, new technology. Um, we also do that now for Applied Micro and we fit that into the Aurora line. Um, we have now uh, currently uh, done some concept study Applied Micro if fitted into a liquid cooled system. Uh, we typically are focused on energy efficiency and ARM fits perfectly in that picture. All right, thanks everybody. So first question now to the panels. Uh, Please describe how you're using 64-bit ARM uh, in your HPC platforms, and, and where do you see the benefits compared with the incumbent architecture, which obviously is x86? Hey, you want to start? Sure, okay. start? So, uh, you know, we, you can actually see the what we're doing with it in our booth and in an Applied Micro's booth. We have a demo running. Uh, we've got uh, CUDA software supported on uh, ARM64 uh, with Applied Micro. Uh, on the you know the Mustang uh, dev kit, um, we're actually uh, working with uh, everyone here to uh, bring this to market. So you can order now, right? These systems uh, to ship soon, uh, and we'll we obviously have all the CUDA software working. The demo is a HPCG. Uh, this is the new benchmark, as most of you know. So we've been running HPCG on the ARM Plus GPU platform. Uh, we have lots of customers interested. We've internally actually also been working on some of the applications like Amber and NAMD uh, to get them running on the platform. Uh, uh, so, you know, lots of application work happening now. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so from uh, Mianok's perspective, uh, we believe in flexibility, um, ability to choose open platforms, open source, standardizations. Um, things that enables people to innovate, run their applications, modify things, and deliver or get much higher return on investment from the system they build. Um, so Mianox support all CPU architectures out there. Uh, we support x86, we support open power, and we're very happy to work on ARM. We believe that ARM enables further capabilities, further flexibility, um, ability to combine multiple elements together and form a scalable infrastructure that can use for HPC workloads, big data, and others. Our mission is to enable the fastest data movement in and out and enabling overall highest performance. So demonstrating 1.5 microsecond latency on a real MPI running and 40 gigabit per second, that shows that the performance is there. So coming in and bringing the 64B, that enables the air of ARM that can actually go into HPC workloads and can actually be used. Yep, and, uh, and even just to, to follow that up, so as I was saying, with um, our engagement with Calzita, we've got about 100 POC customers out there in the field at the moment all running 32-bit, and one of the most common um, reports we always get back is they just need 64-bit for scientific workloads. We've done a range of applications and tests, and I mean, even with the, the University of Luxembourg, we actually produced a white paper which did an evaluation of a load of HPC workloads. Um, feel free to pop by the booth, and I'll be happy to share links to that with you. But again, consistent reports were, while the 32-bit cores were fine, they weren't up to the task. And for it to be really considered to be a HPC uh, player, we needed the 64-bit architecture. So as soon as we knew APM were working on that, we immediately parted up with those guys. They were way ahead of the field. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a key 
platform we believe in HPC in the future. Um, it's got a very, very mature ecosystem now as well. So I mean, when we were playing with it in the early days, most of the challenge was actually getting the system to boot up and correct modules and get stuff working, get a compiler that actually did stuff correctly. All of that stuff now has been uh, brought up to speed, fully mature, been working with Red Hat and Canonical over the course of the number of years. And um, even on one of the platforms we have, we have an ARM as a service uh, cloud platform for people to kind of log in remotely and test stuff out and kick the tires. Um, one of the most refreshing feedbacks we got was some people didn't even realize they were working on ARM. So you have a look through the Yum repository, all the applications are there, all of your con consistent tools are there, profilers, compilers, debuggers, everything is just there. So unless you're poking around in dmessage or proxy PU info, some users weren't even aware that they were actually running on ARM. So I, th I think that's a kind of a, a great reflection on how much work has gone in over the past, not even just three years, but even five years and going back even further than that. We're kind of, we're at that stage now where we have 64, but a mature ecosystem and a, and a demand for lower, more efficient uh, computing platforms. And I think everything is kind of coming to a, to a head now at this point. It's a good time to be in it. Uh, excellent, David. Somehow we have seen similar limitation to ARM 32-bit that David said. Yeah. I mean, basically, customer wants to have something more powerful and capable to have a larger memory. In particular for us, it was important to move to ARM 64-bit because basically we are working in conjunction with GPU since three years. And basically, uh, one of the problem was the reduction of a quantity of a memory of a GPUs due to the lack of memory in ARM 32-bit. And the other problem was uh, the connectivity, the I.O of an ARM 32-bit is not enough to move the data in and out from, from a big GPU like a K20 or K40. Mm -hmm. So basically you need something more powerful in terms of uh, capability of I.O., but still low power in order to increase the efficiency of, of the system. And I think that XGene can fit perfectly in this, in this sector. You know? Does the memory bandwidth also help, uh, the four-channel memory bandwidth? Right now, the, the valve board that, uh, that NVIDIA is showing is only a two-channel, so there's still a lot more bandwidth capable yeah. in the future. Yeah, we will see more bandwidth in the future with the four-channel. Paul? Eurotech is uh, producing a lot of embedded boards based on ARM. Uh, for a HPC, there was never a solution. I think 64-bit has been explained enough. But uh, for us, especially on, based on the energy efficiency of this solution, we think with this uh, 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 solution we can build more energy-efficient liquid-cooled systems that are compact, uh, so the compute density will increase dramatically with this kind of technology. Okay. Actually, let me uh, add that question later on, so I'm going to jump right to it. So how important is energy efficiency in the HPC market yeah. and, and just in computing in general? Yeah. Is, is, is that the most important thing in, in your space? Yeah. Yeah, so the, uh, um, the compute power has to increase dramatically in the coming years, and the only way to do that is to uh, put more compute power uh, uh, in the limited space that we have, but also limited by the energy use. Uh, uh, the only way to go is to liquid cool that and to... Um, uh, also look for, for ways to, to build that in very compact space. Uh, the space limitation, energy limitation, especially for the European market, is limiting at the moment the performance of the HPC. Mm -hmm. How about TCO? Has, has that impact as well? Yeah. Uh, at the moment, the price that people pay for, the, uh, for operating the HPC over three years is higher than the initial price to buy the machine. Mm -hmm. um, that... Uh, Still in Europe, even in Europe, where this is quite evident, it's very difficult to talk about this with the data center at the initial sales, uh, at the initial purchase. So this is something that's uh, developed a lot by the European Commission at the moment to make this part of the tendering that's going on. But as soon as that is fixed, I think there's a big space for this kind of solutions. Yeah, when you don't have a government paying, a big government paying for a big uh, machine with lots and lots of kilowatts. Yeah. 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 Piero, how, how, about you, how about your perspective on power efficiency and, and, and TCO? Power efficiency is, is a, obviously a key factor, has been explained. And I think that uh, before having the solution, for example, the, the Aurora solution that will come out with an ARM 64-bit inside will be really, really efficient. I mean, they are incredibly efficient, the, that machines. But at the moment, we need to do you know, a step on develop all the ecosystem to be efficient when everything will be ready, mm. you know? And uh, this is the reason because we are not working at the moment with the highest possible efficient machine or with the most dense. But we made a machine that is capable to do PCI Express, uh, to use uh, InfiniBand, to use uh, 10 gigabit, have uh, GPUs inside, in order to allow all the developers to have a machine to do 
the, the ecosystem ready. And then we will discover that uh, thanks to the reduction in power consumption and with the whole ecosystem software stack ready, you will really gain some money out of it, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of total cost of ownership. And you can also pack more, if you have a, a fixed uh, budget of uh, power or, or TCO, you can pack more performance into a space. I mean, you will have both. You have, yeah. will have less space. I mean, you can pack everything and you can have a lower power consumption. I still uh, need to, to really tune the performances and have a look. That uh, is an exciting period because nobody knows exactly what we can squeeze out of an ARM CPU. You know, everyone, everybody wants to have their application and see how good it can run. Yeah. And I think this is, this is really the, the point where we are. Now it's the starting point. Yeah. Well, Applied Micro is an exciting core because it's, it's a wide issue. It's a really brawny core. It's not, it's not, a, you know, it's not like an atom or something. It it's, has a lot of performance there. David, your perspective as well. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, well, power efficiency and um, yes, power optimization, it's, it's nothing new. Everyone yeah. is speaking about it. It's one of the big challenges, of course, we have in getting to exascale and squeezing that amount of performance within the, the 20 megawatt budget or uh, as uh, declared. But um, I mean, there's no greater example than look at what that had to do with Roadrunner, right? It was the first petaflop-based system, but because of the amount of power it actually consumed, I mean, you can do an awful lot of very useful science with a petaflop, like why would people yeah. decommission and turn this off? But the running cost just got completely out of hand. It wasn't actually cost-effective to continue running it at the power limits that it was, and it's just been, been decommissioned. So, I mean, power efficiency is a critical factor. It's becoming more and more of a decision with regards to system purchase and TCO, so it's, it's as big a factor as the performance nowadays. Mm -hmm. How much application performance can you get per watt? That's going to be one of the key metrics we have moving forward. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you expect to be getting uh, a, a good uh, uh, TCO and, and power efficiency when you get the system up and running with the applied micro? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have a good idea of where it should be based on our previous experience, and we've seen performance per watt improvements on certain applications of you know seven and eight x over some of the alternative architectures. So, based on the numbers we're expecting to see, we should see quite a very competitive uh, uh, solution. Okay, Gail, from from a Melnox perspective, I'm sure you guys have. Uh Focused on power and efficiency as well. For yeah, and, and and just one comment. Uh, I think you know you, you refer to Roadrunner. I think Roadrunner helped to push the envelope and to bring more applications. Oh, so it was back uh, in the day, it was incredibly important. Power efficient. And, and typically, you decommission systems after four or five years. So it's mm. it's and then you build a new one. So it's it's, it's a good. There is good reasons to decommission mm. old systems. Um, you know, I, I look at it more as a cost performance element. And under cost, you can put. Uh, um, CapEx, OPEX, energy, and other things. And what you want to do is to maximize cost performance. Mm -hmm. That's what you want to do. Um, and therefore, what you want to do is not just taking things that are very low energy, because I can build something that's very low energy, but I won't be able to run any HPC application on it. So it doesn't really help me. And when you look on the cost performance, you want to make sure that you get the needed performance there, and you minimize CapEx and OPEX. And I think that ARM platform is a great candidate for doing so. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're putting effort from our side in order to make sure that you can squeeze the maximum efficiency out of that system. It's when you squeeze that out, you can really achieve the right cost performance elements. Um, on the new top 500, on, on top 500 list, you can, for the first time, I think you can start see systems that achieve 99.8% efficiency, which is an amazing number. Yeah. Um, and when you're achieving those numbers, you, you maximize what you get from the systems and then the rest falls in the right place. And the reason that we're work, working with Applied Micro is because we can think that together we can deliver to the users. That's exciting. Sumit? You know, I think everyone said enough on this. Uh, <laughs> the only factor that I'll throw out there is, uh, uh, you know, if we were to build an exaflop machine today, we would need more power than the city of San Francisco. So let's choose. <laughs> Do, should we power down the city or uh, power up the supercomputer? <laughs> That's a tough question, by right. the way. No. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I live in the Bay Area. That's not a good question. <laughs> um, well, I'm, we got you at Smith again. Um, what kind of workloads do you see uh, best fit uh, the GPU plus the ARM uh, solution? I, I think the biggest benefit of clubbing a GPU with ARM is that it actually extends the reach of ARM64 for the entire HPC market, right? I think, my opinion, and I'm of course biased, right? Without, <laughs> without a GPU, ARM will struggle to address the entire HPC market, right? The performance level, in, in, especially in the highest performance applications, is just not there, right? With a GPU, 
we can together address the entire market, right? So I, that's a uh, NVIDIA perspective, but um, I don't see any limitation of any application in HPC or data analytics or machine learning that, you know, I, I see all of those applications as really good candidates of, of the pair. So, so any place you're putting a GPU today for, for acceleration, it, it, it'll, it will make a difference whether it's an x86 or, or an applied micro ARM, 64-bit ARM. Do you see a difference? Um, every application has different sensitivity. Some applications are sensitive to the number of cores in, mm -hmm. in the device. So in that case, right, uh, Xgene already has eight cores uh, going to 16 and more. Yeah. And, and so those applications will benefit from being able to get lots of cores, getting the four memory channels. Some applications are very much sensitive to uh, single core latency. Mm -hmm. Those applications might be at a dis disadvantage using ARM, or might run better on x86 or, or uh, even open power, right? Okay, you can leave now, you said yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's always a trade-off. Trade it's always a trade-off. I think uh, I think Gilad yeah. put it well, which is at the end of the day, customers will look at total cost of solution. They'll look at total power and performance. Right? There's, yeah. It's not a simple decision. There's a very complex TCO decision that goes into these things. Well, I guess Gilad, because from your point of view, it's, uh, workloads are probably uh, on ARM versus. Do you see a difference between ARM and x86 itself? No, you know, I think that, uh, and, and I agree with Samir, so it's, it's, it's nice that we agree with one another here. Um, <laughs> Once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> you guys um, traveling together a lot these days? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think that if you create something that is specialized for specific elements only, or element of property or things like that, that's something that properly not going to take off. And if you build something that address the market that needs to address the entire application segments, be able to use it as multiple places, and even beyond HPC, you want things to go into data analytics and other things which resemble HPC work more or less. And I don't think that there is anything that prohibit ARM to be used in any application that x86 or other CPU platforms are playing in. Okay, that's good. You can mm -hmm. stay. David. Yeah, I mean, what, I think what we're all the best? beginning to kind of echo each other in, yeah, in these know, responses. It's, 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 but um, I mean, yeah, we'll we've, we've kumbaya, seen. We'll sing Kumbaya soon. So yeah, uh, well, we've had a very diverse uh, group of users right through from oil and gas to bioinformatics. And yeah. we've identified kind of niche use cases where the, the, the lower capability ARM CPUs are actually quite relevant. And I mean, and as we progress and as we move to 64, but and even further generations ahead, it, it, they become more and more capable. And that widens the net for kind of HPC usage. So. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think initially it, it's a, a very good platform for I.O. intensive applications. Um, we've seen very good storage performance numbers off, um, off ARM as well. So we ported Fraunhofer on there and we've got worked with Ink Tank and Ceph, um, moved all that over onto ARM and been testing on that. So it's, it's a yeah. good candidate in that sort of a, a sense as well. Well, considering your background, considering the, the Calzita work, uh, is there still a, an application for people who use 32-bit ARM uh, backwards compatible AR32? Because not, not all... Our arm via You're right. So, I mean, some have. of our web hosting customers, they don't actually need the 64-bit the stuff. They're just running a couple of yeah. fairly low-rate Apache servers. All you got to do is serve up pages, query a database. Mm -hmm. So, for that, you don't necessarily need it. Um, in the scientific community, more, I think the vast majority of people that we are dealing with there, they could potentially run on 32-bit, but the, after spending, I guess, the previous decade going from 32-bit Intel to 64-bit, mm -hmm. why are they going to go back? and yeah. reverse engineer their oh, code yeah. back to the olden days again. So it's a... But if there's some install pages of 32, they can, they can port it and, and still run it at 32-bit uh, if they had to. Mm. On, on, uh, That's right, yeah. And I'm sure we'll still have 32-bit libraries on the system anyway, even if it's 64, but so you can kind of run in either mode. So there's not a problem there. You're up at workloads. What do you have to say? About the 32-bit, 64-bit in the scientific community, the answer is quite clear also from the, the GPU products. You know? Yeah. GPUs are... They, they, they implemented the 64-bit because double precision is important. But at the beginning, a GPU was just meant for single precision. Mm -hmm. Now we need it in this community, and it's, it came. But anyway, I see at the moment that there will be, a, a, in any kind of market, a niche where ARM maybe will not fit. But at the moment, Xgene is a real general purpose CPU. It's so general that it can be applied in HPC and in any kind of market where x86 is dominating now. Mm -hmm. So basically, now we are talking about HPC, but 
it could, we can do the same discussion for every kind of application, virtualization, storage, or whatever. So basically, I don't see any limitation in the usage of, uh, of the CPU. Of course, we are in the early days, so we have to understand better all the, the benefit to have it and to use it. Uh, and probably we will need also newer version of the CPUs that they are developing. I mean, Xgene is progressing very fast. Yes. And basically, I think we will be able to address much more end users in the future going on with the ecosystem and with the new version of the CPUs. Okay. Thanks. Paul. Yeah, the last in line. Um, yeah, uh, something to add is uh, there's also one customer of us uh, measuring energy to solution. And there I'm very curious to see what will be the outcome of, uh, of this architecture. We already uh, run uh, Xeon with, uh, with NVIDIA K20 and also with Xeon, uh, Xeon <laughs> Fives. And we compare what is the result uh, uh, of the solution, of course, but also in relation to the energy used to compute. Um, and I think uh, we build in all the sensors and all the actuators to make this happening on the on the design that we made with Applied Micro, and I'm very curious about the results of that study. Okay. And, and my final question is going to, to the panel is that where do you see the future of HPC now that we have 64-bit um, arms uh, in the mix? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. For us, uh, that uh, it's uh, access scale has been brought up, uh, so we need to package more and more CPUs in the smaller space, and I think uh, this is a perfect step in that direction. Of course, we are curious, curious to see how far, uh, how further the development will go with Applied Micro, but the time to market that we achieve with them, when we got the chips in our hands and bringing the product uh, on our table working, and hopefully finding some customers to bring it really as a product to the market, has been enormous as well. And I think this is also an important aspect of working with Applied. Micro. It's not only the technology, but also the work that we have to put in it as an integrator to bring it to the market. Mm -hmm. I work way backwards. Mm -hmm. Where do you see the future? About the future, uh, I saw a nice slide from a guy in Barcelona Supercomputing Center. You know, this, this slide shows that uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was top 500 dominated by vector processors, yeah. like famous NEC or whatever kind of CPUs. And uh, now it's dominated by x86. But uh, somehow, in between uh, 2000 and 2003, there was a kind of crossing point between Victoria processor and x86. And there was a swap. This was due to the volume, the, the number of CPUs that has been produced, the cost per CPU, and the performances. I mean, maybe in the future we can see some other crossing point, you know? where ARM CPU can be more competitive in terms of price, in terms of uh, features, because you can integrate everything in a system on chip. Right. You can pack much more, much more dense space. Uh, so basically, we maybe could see another swap in the technology in the next future. I don't know when, but could. Innovation from, uh, and innovation and disruption from below. It's a tradition yeah. in the market. David. Um, yeah, well, I mean, that's a nice question to kind of tie in all the vendors that we actually have here. So, I mean, the future is all about higher density, yeah. faster interconnects, faster accelerators, and a more power-efficient platform. So, you kind of throw everything together from everybody that we have in the room, and, you know, there's potentially your answer for what we're looking at in the future. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think the power is one of the, the key factors. As, of course, we scale up these systems, we're going to have potentially billions of threads as well. So, the interconnect plays a key role in that as well. Of course, we're going to have to rely on the real intelligent guys, the software developers, to, to write software that runs at that scale. But um, thankfully, that's not a challenge that I have to investigate myself. Um, and, and, and yeah, I think Spoke more like hardware guy, bigger, faster, lower power uh, is, uh, is essentially the, the order of the day. Yeah, I'll make it short. Uh, you know, f this, the way that I see it is that uh, you know the 64-bit was it that was an issue that uh, prohibited. ARM to get into the HPC space is no longer. Uh, that means that you have a, a valid solution to be used now. And since it's a open platform based and people can look into innovations and bring things into, uh, into that platforms and others. So therefore, there is a very um, good opportunity for ARM to take bigger and bigger portion of not only HPC but other places as well. Um, and we are all in favor of flexibility, capabilities, innovations, and we'll see how it goes. Finally. Oh, sorry. Smith?
on it. <laughs> there you are. Uh, and um, if you know, I'll say it in a different way because I have the same perspective, but uh, I'll say the same perspective in my my viewpoint or the way I say it, which is um, about 10, 15 years ago, essentially people started taking PCs and racking them. This was the advent of the PC cluster, right? And at the end of the day, the reason they did that was because a PC was really, really cheap, right? That's why people started building PC clusters. It was really cheap to build them. You started, then you had the Beowulf project, right? ARM is now the new PC. So it follows that the new PC cluster, which is what we all build today, is an ARM-based PC, right? PC cluster. So I think that's the natural evolution of what's happening. And that's why we're seeing this technology that is now in all of our pockets, in many of our hands right now, as our PC, is going to be the next revolution in, in the data center. And it's not just an HBC thing. I mean, in fact, uh, I, I would argue Applied Micro, and I'm sure Parmesh sees it this way too, Applied Micro's biggest opportunity is in the general data center. right? The HPC opportunity is, is, is an additive opportunity. Uh, so I think we, we'll see that trend growing. Um, and, and the other aspect to HPC in particular is that the, the processor that wins in any computing market is the processor that gets the most developers to start using it. The best processor does not win, right? Yeah. Uh, x86 already proved that point. The best that. processor <laughs> does not win, right? And, and there's many examples in history, right? There's so many examples. Uh, RISC versus CISC, uh, Itanium, there's so many examples out there, right? Uh, HP, PA RISC, there's, there's just tons. The best processor does not win. It's the architecture that actually gets the most developers. Mm -hmm. The architecture with the most developers in the world today already is ARM. Right, so, so let, let's just draw the line and extend it out and, and you can see where it ends. And that's honestly what our strategy on GPUs has been too, mm -hmm. right? We, we've focused on getting more developers. We have always focused on that, mm -hmm. right? So. Thanks, and then uh, actually the one other thing I would, just, just to add a little counterpoint, not counterpoint, but just a little addition to that, is innovation is often, and in, disruption has often come from, from the smaller cores and worked their way up. I mean, you had the big vector machines, expensive machines, and then x86 came and disrupted that. Now x86 is the expensive machine. Right. And now it's time for another architecture to come and disrupt that as well. And I think that's what you're seeing here. Well, thanks. I like, well, we're running a little bit late over time. Sorry for, for that, everybody. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate Thank it. You.